let me start by saying this. Uh, fluoridation is one of the easiest health problems that we have to end. It's the easiest one that we can end. We can end it by turning off a tap. All you need is a strong wrist, a strong wrist, and we can turn off this unnecessary evil at the waterworks. But to turn that tap, we need political will. And to get that political will, we need masses of people informed and organized. I have spent the last 17 years researching the fluoridation issue, first as a professor of chemistry, specializing in environmental chemistry and toxicology, and then the director of FAN. Now, after uh, 14 years of this, I got together with two other scientists, we wrote this book. And um, one of the best decisions I think I made in, in 17 years was to ask James Beck, MD, PhD, uh, a physicist from Alberta, uh, Calgary, Alberta, and Spedding Micklem, a biologist trained at Oxford and teaching at Edinburgh University. So we have three retired professors, one in biology, one in chemistry, one in physics, and we wrote this book. But I cannot tell you how, what a wonderful contribution these other two made. They, they got the tone right. This book is understated, not overstated. Everything is documented, and they don't go into attacking. They, they, they certainly acknowledge some of the arguments, the other side, and every single argument is documented in the scientific literature. There's 80 pages of references there. And believe me, this is your protection. You, you know, one of the things about citizens is they don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to go out in public and, and say something and be embarrassed. And, and the other side makes a special art of embarrassing people. You know, if you only knew as much as they do, they'd re you'd realize that you were stupid. That's the, the message that comes from these, these experts. But believe you me, after two years, they have no answer to this book. There's been no scientific response, critique of this book. So if you get attacked in public, if you're made to feel that you are a member of the Flat Earth Society or you put on a tinfoil hat or whatever the uh, thing that they do to put you down, just wave this book and say, have you got a response to this book? Have you produced a written response to this? And by the way, are you prepared to debate Professor Conant? Uh, because he will come back to New Zealand. So if you can pluck up courage and defend your position in public, he will debate you. Are you ready to debate him? Yes or no? Put up or shut up. I am, I am tired. I'm very, very tired of being insulted by people who have not read the literature, who think it's enough to qu quote a movie made in 1964 to counteract all the science that we put on the table. The movie, of course, is Dr. Strangelove. Anyway, <laughs> so the outline of my talk, uh, I will explain that fluoridation is a poor medical practice, that it's unethical, uh, the evidence of any benefit is very weak, the, there's no adequate margin of safety to protect from known health effects. Uh, why does the New Zealand Ministry of Health continue to push fluoridation? We have to uh, conjecture there. And better alternatives. And then seven, how can you help to end fluoridation in Auckland? And that's where we're going to break off, before I talk about that, to deal with this, these submissions. Okay. It's a poor medical practice. Fluoridation is the only example in New Zealand of using the public water supply to deliver medicine. And, and why not? Well, for obvious reasons. Once you put a medicine in the water, you can't control who it goes to. It goes to babies, it goes to infants, it goes to children, it goes to the elderly, it goes to the sick. It goes to people with poor nutrition. It goes to people with poor kidney function, who in the case of fluoride can't get rid of the fluoride. And it goes to people with borderline iodine deficiency, and they're particularly uh, vulnerable to fluoride toxicity. Ask a pharmacist if there's any medicine in his store that he can give to anybody, everybody. No, of course not, you can't. Then ask him if there's any medicine that you don't have to control the dose. Take as much as you want. 
Drink as much water as you want. It's ridiculous. Can't control who goes to, can't control the dose. In New Zealand, it's worse. Uh, no doctor has prescribed this medication. Nobody's tracking individual response. Doctors in medical school are not trained to recognize the side effects of fluorine. Um, no New Zealand health agency is monitoring exposure. There's no monitoring in New Zealand of the level of fluoride in people's urine, in their blood, and most particularly in their bones. By now you should have thousands and thousands of data points. You should know how much fluoride you can expect to have in your bones as a function of how many years you've been drinking fluoridated water. How many data points do you have? Zero. None. How many health studies have you got in New Zealand? Zero. This is the lousiest, it, first of all it's a lousy experiment, but it's the lousiest experiment because you're not even collecting the data. Uh, fluoride is not a nutrient to, to demonstrate that a substance is a nutrient. You have to starve an animal of this substance in its diet, take it away, and then demonstrate that some disease accrues. And if no disease accrues, then, then it's, uh, it's not a nutrient. Nobody's ever demonstrated a fluoride deficiency a disease, a disease caused by fluoride deficiency. Dental disease is not caused by lack of fluoride. Dental disease is caused by too much sugar. Um, there's not one single biochemical process, any biological molecule, any biological reaction, any process in the body that needs fluoride. The first opponents of fluoridation in the United States were biochemists. Biochemists that had used fluoride in their experiments to poison enzymes. And they realized that this, this, should not, this substance should go nowhere near uh, the body's systems. Two Nobel Prizes in enzyme chemistry opposed fluoridation. The chemicals used are not pharmaceutical grade, as used in dental products. They come from the wet scrubbers, a spray of water of the phosphate fertilizer industry. And these are designed to capture two toxic gases, hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride, which for 100 years decimated the vegetation in the area of phosphate processing plants. Sodium fluoride, sodium silica fluoride, and fluorosilic acid, all used in dental offices, toothpaste, and water fluoridation, are toxic waste substances created from the creation processes in the fertilizer, steel, nuclear, and aluminum industries. These artificial substances should not be confused with the natural occurring fluoride element. They call them wet scrubbers. The pollution control devices used by the phosphate industry to capture fluoride gases produced in the production of commercial fertilizer. In the past, when the industry let these gases escape, vegetation became scorched, crops destroyed, and cattle crippled. Once you captured this scrubbing liquor, which is a solution of hexafluorosilicic acid. What can, you do, what can they do with that scrubbing liquor? <laughs> what can't they do with it? They can't dump it into the sea by international law. They can't dump it locally because it's far too concentrated. It would cost an arm and a leg to get rid of it as a hazardous waste. But we have this vagary in hazardous waste regulations that if someone buys a hazardous waste, from the chemical industry, it becomes then a product. And on that basis, they can put it into the drinking water. Now, these industrial grade chemicals contain many pollutants, and one of them, usually present in most of the batches that are tested, is arsenic. Arsenic is a known human carcinogen, and at least from the point of view of the US EPA, there is no safe level for a human carcinogen. Uh, that means that inevitably, by using these industrial grade chemicals to fluoridate the water, you are increasing the cancer rates in New Zealand. We can argue about how much, or how big, or how small this increase is, but what they cannot deny is there will be an increase because arsenic is a known human carcinogen with no safe level. And that's over and above the possibility that fluoride itself causes cancer. Now, the proponents claim that they're merely adjusting the levels of a naturally occurring element. Well, is anybody talking about adjusting the levels of naturally occurring arsenic? 
Just because something occurs naturally does not make it safe. Arsenic is not safe, fluoride is not safe. But as far as nature is concerned, we have a very good indicator of what nature thinks is safe. Safe for a newborn baby. The level in mother's milk is extremely small. It's 0 0.004 parts per million. Now, you, the average level that you fluoridate in New Zealand is 0 0.85. So you are giving, if you bottle feed your baby and you use tap water, you're giving your baby 200 times more fluoride than a breastfed baby, or put it another way, 200 times more fluoride than nature intended for the baby. Now, who knows more about what the baby needs? Nature, after experimenting for thousands or millions of years with evolution, or a bunch of dentists in Chicago. I put my money on Mother Nature. So in New Zealand, you fluoridate between 0.7 and 1 parts per million fluoride. The average is 0.85. That's 200 times the level in mother's milk. To put that another way, it's 20,000% higher than a breastfed baby. In my view, that's irresponsible and reckless. Once you know that, it's irresponsible and reckless for a pediatrician to stand by and let this happen. The water fluoridation, they say, the proponents claim that water fluoridation is not medication. But the definition of, medicine, of a medicine is a substance used to treat a disease. And we are using this substance to treat or prevent um, dental decay. So clearly fluoride is a medicine and fluoridation is mass medication. It's a poor medical practice. <laughs> In the United States, the US Food and Drug Administration has never, after 68 years, has never regulated fluoride for ingestion. It's neither regulated fluoride pills nor fluoride in water. And its official classification of fluoride, and it took us some time to get this in writing, is that it's an unapproved drug. Well, think of that. We have an unapproved, the most prescribed medication in US history going to more people over 200 people, million people every day in their drinking water, and it's never been regulated by the FDA, never been approved by the FDA. And as a result, there have never been randomized clinical trials to demonstrate either the effectiveness or safety of fluoridation. None. Fluoridation is not ethical. No government has the right to force medication on its people, period. It, it deprives individuals of their right to informed consent to medication. A local government, your Auckland government, is doing to everyone what no single doctor in Auckland could do to anyone. Let me say that again. The city of Auckland is doing to everyone in Auckland what an individual doctor could do to no one in Auckland. An individual doctor could say, if he went up to you and said, I put something in this glass of water, which is going to be good for you, drink it. You say, I don't want to drink it. Drink it. No, I don't want to drink it. Drink it. No, I don't want to drink it. Well, if you don't drink it, don't come back to my office. If he was to use pressure to force you to take a medication like that, he or she could lose their license. But this play has been written by Kafka. We're doing this to everybody. Um, in my view, our doctors should be ashamed uh, to uh, allow water fluoridation to take place. This room should be full of doctors here, full of doctors. Because doctors are taught about informed consent to medication. If you go to the web page of the American Medical Association, it very clearly spells out what informed consent to medication is. And I'm assuming that New Zealand doctors also get this training. So how can they stand by and see this violated? Probably because they've got friends in the Rotary Club or the Golf Club, friend, dental friends, and they think they're doing their dental colleagues a favor. After all, this is about teeth, right? This is about teeth. So we let the dentist get on with it. No, this is more. We have more tissues in our body than teeth. 
We have brains, we have bones, we have kidneys, we have endocrine systems. So these doctors should help us get dentistry out of the public water supply and back into the dental office. You want to practice dentistry? Do it in your dental office. Don't practice it with my water, thank you very much. I don't want my dentist in my water. Leave it alone. Excuse me, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> the evidence of benefit is very, very weak. This is one of the shocks for us. This is one of the shocks. When we wrote this book, we had assumed, I think like most people, that the argument, the big arguments would be, is this dangerous? We know it's good. We know it's good for us because the dentists all tell us it's wonderful. But the shock was that when we looked at the literature on the effectiveness of, of swallowing fluoride, whether or not swallowing fluoride reduces tooth decay, we were amazed how weak the evidence was the story of two relationships. We look at the first relationship is fluoride in water and a condition called dental fluorosis. Now, dental fluorosis is a mottling of the teeth. It's a well-known biomarker of overexposure to fluoride before your permanent teeth have come out. It's a systemic effect. It, it's fluoride interfering with the growing tooth cells, interfering with the, the enamel. So, very mild dental fluorosis has little white specks on the cusp of the teeth at one end of the spectrum, and then this is at the other end of the spectrum, where up to 25% of the tooth surface has this patchy, chalky appearance. And with time, that can get discolored, go yellow, orange, brown, and so on. Now, mild dental fluorosis, notice the terminology, mild, is, is up to 50% of the tooth surface impacted. And moderate or severe is 100% of the tooth surface impacted with, the, with indentations and with the severe crumbling, brittleness uh, uh, as, as well. Now, what we're going to look at that same database from the National Institute of Dental Research that I've already talked about. And over here is the level of fluoride in the water, that left-hand column, less than 0.3, between 0.3 and 0.7 parts per million, 0.7 to 1.2, and greater than 1.2. Now, then look at the pre prevalence of dental fluorosis. This is for thousands of children in the United States, 39,000 children, and see how the prevalence of dental fluorosis goes up with the increased concentration of fluoride in the water. 14.6, 19.6, 25.2, 40.5. There is a very clear relationship between the amount of fluoride in the water and this condition called dental fluorosis. Now let's look at the same concentrations in the water and look at the children, this is fluoride in water, with dental caries. The central column in green. Less than 0 0.3, 55.5. This is children with carry. 0 0.3 to 0 0.7, 54.6. 0 0.7 to 1.2, that's artificial fluoridation, 54.4. Uh, greater than 1.2, 56.4. There is not a clear relationship between fluoride in the water and dental caries. There's a strong relationship with dental fluorosis. Uh, now, even more blatant, this is what teeth uh, look like if they're exposed to fluoridated water. This is what teeth apparently look like if they're exposed to non-fluoridated water. Now, this is so incredibly crude. It's Orwellian. It really is. Do so you think the difference between those two sets of teeth is 0.17 of a tooth surface? No, this is blatant propaganda, absolute blatant propaganda. And this is not coming from industry. This is coming from tax-paid civil servants. And let's get one thing clear. Civil servants should not be spinning the literature. Civil servants should be presenting to decision-makers objective analysis. 
a balance, a careful balance of the science, both sides. It's a decision making. If there's going to be any spin, it should be from politicians, because everybody knows that politicians spin everything. Yeah. But we're paying civil servants for something different. Yeah. They get large salaries. And I think it's time that we created a fuss. All the attention is on politicians. Politicians are corrupt. Politicians are lying. But underneath these politicians are these slime, these faceless people who are manipulating, for whatever reasons, manipulating science to serve a political agenda. That's not their job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now let's look at the. They do it all the time. Yeah. Now let's look at the New Zealand scam. I will take your question later. Okay. So run the clock forward, and Betty De Leefter in 1998 described the difference in tooth decay in the permanent teeth between fluoridated and non-fluoridated communities in New Zealand as clinically meaningless. And there's been a very important study from Iowa. This is the famous Iowa study where a huge amount of US government money is going to studying children's teeth from the, from the moment they're born through. And this was a study of children from zero to nine years. And what they did in this study, what no one else has done hitherto, they actually measured the amount of fluoride the kids were ingesting. Not whether, whether they lived in a Florida community or non florida community, but actually how much fluoride they were ingesting. And they found no relation between tooth decay and the amount of fluoride swallowed, ingested. This is what they actually said in their conclusion. These findings suggest that achieving a caries-free status may have relatively little to do with fluoride intake, while fluorosis is clearly more dependent on fluoride intake. One of the things they set out to do was to define the optimal level of fluoride that you needed to fight tooth decay. They couldn't do it. They could not define what an optimal level of fluoride was from this experiment. Now, I presented this paper last time I was here in uh, April, I think, of 2011. And after I'd left, Dr. Robert Robin Wyman, who's the, the chief spokesman for the pro-fluoridation movement in New Zealand, and prepared a response to my presentation for the National Fluoridation Information Service. This is the propaganda machinery set up by the Ministry of Health to push fluoridation throughout New Zealand and defend it from attacks like, like mine. And this is what he said. Uh, Professor Connett's highlighting of the conclusion from Warren et al. 2009 that there was no relationship between fluoride ingested and tooth decay levels is unsurprising. It is generally accepted that the principle carries protective effect from fluoride is topical. Precisely, Dr. Wyman, precisely. Swallowing fluoride doesn't do any good. Fluoride works on the surface of the teeth. I'm glad you recognize that, Dr. Wyman. But shouldn't that be the reason why you stop putting fluoride in the drinking water and focus on topical applications? If the benefit is topical, even the promoters of fluoridation, not just Robin Wyman, but the Center of Disease Control in the United States, have admitted that the predominant beneficial action of fluoride is topical, not systemic. In other words, it works on the outside of the tooth enamel, not from inside the body. Uh, so why swallow fluoride and expose every tissue in the body to a known toxic substance when you can brush it on and spit it out? Uh, can we leave the questions to the end because I'm frightened it will use up too much time. And why put it in the drinking water and force it on people that don't want it? By using universally available fluoridated toothpaste, you avoid the medical issues and the ethical problems of not forcing it on people. When the CDC admitted in 1999 that the predominant benefit of fluoride was topical, it should have ended fluoridation there and then. 
And at this point, you can see the difference between science and politics. The science says it's stupid to continue, but the politics says keep going, keep crossing the big muddy, the big fool says push on. I'm quoting a Pete Seeger song about Vietnam. This is what Arby Carlson said about the revelation that the benefits are topical. Uh, Arby Carlson is the scientist who led the successful campaign against fluoridation in Sweden in the 1970s. He says, in pharmacology, if the effect is local, i.e. topical, it's awkward to use it in any other way than as a local treatment, as a topical treatment. I mean, this is obvious. You have the teeth there, they're available for you, why drink the stuff? So now then we have to see the other side of the coin. Well, first of all, if it's not doing any good, if swallowing fluoride doesn't reduce tooth decay, that should be the end of the story. If it doesn't work, why do it? First of all, the harmful effects of fluoride have been carefully documented in a 507-page report by the United States National Research Council, published in 2006. Uh, this, took, uh, it, this took them three and a half years. It's the most comprehensive document, and it is revealing that the promoting health agencies in the fluoridating countries have largely ignored this report. And that goes for New Zealand, it goes for Australia, and it goes for the United States, it goes for Canada. But they looked at the harmful effects of fluoride, including dental fluorosis, brain damage, lowered thyroid function, accumulation in the pineal gland, bone damage, osteosarcoma, mixed studies there, and um, some people have very sensitive to very low levels of fluoride. They examined that as well. They examined other issues, but there was a, a lot of big health issues that they examined. Dental fluorosis. This is the easy one. This is the one they don't even bother to deny. They thought at one part per million that they could limit dental fluorosis to 10% of children in its very mild form. Remember, that's up to 25% of the tooth enamel. In 2010, the CDC reported that 41% of American children aged 12 to 15 have dental fluorosis. 28.5% have very mild, 8.6% have mild, and 3.6% have moderate or severe and black and Hispanic children have higher rates of dental fluorosis. New Zealand dental fluorosis rates, there's very little data that's been published in New Zealand, but for what we can see, it's about 30%. It's about 30% in fluoridated communities and about 15% in non-fluoridated communities. 30% is three times higher than the original pioneers of fluoridation anticipated. Now, the real issue is this. When fluoride is damaging the growing tooth cells in the baby, causing this condition, what is it doing to the other tissues? This is what Arvid Carlson again said in 1978. He said, one wonders what an increase in the exposure to fluoride, such as occurs in bottle-fed infants, may mean for the development of the brain. He's a neuropharmacologist, so he's interested in the brain. And that statement was made in 1978. The first animal study didn't come along until about 1995. And the first IQ study didn't come along until 1991. So it was pretty prophetic, his concerns. In 1950, the US government endorsed fluoridation. Not one single trial had been completed, and no health studies of any significance had been published. So it was political then, and it's political today. And one of the reasons they don't do the studies is they don't want to find harm, because they don't want to threaten this policy. Something that is driving this policy has nothing to do with teeth, and certainly nothing to do with protecting our health. And what it is, I'm not sure. But one thing that we're certain is that dentists have controlled this, um, this debate for far too long. That's how they see us. We're a great big mouth with little legs on it. The only tissue that they're concerned about are teeth, 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 and teeth. And so we get study after study after study on teeth. 
And where are the studies on the bone? Where are the studies on the brain? Where are the studies on the... And so on. That we've got a lot of resources for you to use. Fan New Zealand has an excellent website. And you, we need to network. We can't do this alone. Uh, right now, there are people all over the country that are drawing tremendous um, energy uh, from the fact that we're making progress in Queensland. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Every time a community stops fluoridation anywhere in the world, everyone in our network celebrates. Same with New Zealand. Uh, our website is, is one of the best, fluoridealert.org. Don't forget that health database that my son, Michael, made. This book is available online, the National Research Council report. You can search it by word. It's, very e it's easy to use, but it's very dense. To do justice to that, you'd have to spend several months on that. That would be good for doctors and scientists, perhaps. Our book was an attempt to make this information more readily accessible to the public, but without insulting their intelligence. Every fact is documented. Um, but th that will take you a few days, a few days to a few weeks to master that material, but you, you would have it. But something that will only take you 29 minutes is there's a videotape on our webpage called Professional Perspectives on Fluoridation. There you'll hear from 15 scientists, one Nobel Prize winner, three members of the National Research Council that wrote that report, two former employees of the US EPA, a couple of dentists that were once pro-fluoridation, now anti-fluoridation, and a few scientists and environmentalists like my, myself. In 29 minutes, they do a pretty good job. You have our permission to make as many copies of, of this as you want. It's simple, isn't it? It's not my practice. It's not your practice. It's their practice. And if it's their practice, and if they are prepared to put a poisonous substance in the drinking water without control of who gets it, without controlling of dose, with lousy science to support the effectiveness and, and the fact that it's safe, if they're prepared to do all those things, then they have to be able to defend it. Excuse me, I'm glad you're here. And I will take your question later. Uh, can we leave the questions to the end because I'm frightened it will use up too much time. Yeah, I'm going to answer your question at the end. I'm going to do with the questions at the end. And I see your hand, please.